Again, we just want to say Happy Mother's Day. And uh, as Karen Ann read that, uh, that little bit of a you know, monologue that was so true, the, the women that have invested in our lives, uh, we need you. We need you to continue to invest in us and, and just want to say thank you. And, and I hope you celebrate this day. And uh, just a couple of just things just to make sure you grab is if, when you get ready to leave today, the uh, photo booth that is out there, we'd love to get you or your family to get a picture, and uh, we'll be posting those online later, and you can grab them from there, be a part of that. We also want to make sure you grab that on June the 2nd, we have baptism here, and that happens in the 1045 service, which this is the service you're in now. Uh, the, the service at 9 will be a regular service, just like the 1045, except there won't be any baptism. So we want you to be a part of that. And to be able to celebrate the stories that are shared are phenomenal. And we can't wait for our baptism service on June 2nd. And you heard in the video and you've heard others talk about it. But Fam Jam is June 9 through 12. And Fam Jam is a four-night high-energy family-focused experience. And this is unreal as we come in. Now, you may be one of those parents that you've already crossed your line when you said, I'm not going to be that parent. When you said, I'm not going to sell my soul to the travel leagues. I'm not, I'm not going to spend every weekend, every weekend in a hotel in a different city for my kid can play t-ball. Whatever that may have been, and you've, and you've already crossed it, so now you're doing it. Fam Jam is an opportunity for us actually to invest in their spiritual lives. And, and more than just what they're doing right here and now. And so if you're thinking, oh, I'm off the hook because I don't have children that age. Uh, no, you're not. We need you. See, this is, it's, it's almost like being a grandparent to 500 children. You get to sugar them up and then send them home. So we need you to be a part of this. So make sure you get it just June 9 through 12, and so be a part of this. So the In Focus series that we started on Easter and we're continuing right now is about seeing Jesus clearly. Because in the post-resurrection occurrences of Jesus, none of them recognized him. They didn't recognize who he was. On Easter Sunday, we talked about the question that he asked, and it's the same question you and I have to answer, is who do you say I am? This is the one that, that every one of us, at some point in our life, we have to answer. Who do we say Jesus is? Mary Magdalene had to answer that question. She said, you're not just a rabbi, you're not just a teacher, but you're my teacher. He asked the disciples, and this question is, it comes out, and it's through the years, it's to us as well. The week after Easter, we looked at the road to Emmaus as Jesus appeared to the disciples. And again, they did not recognize who he was. As he walked with them, we realized that Jesus will always give us what we need, but not always what we want. And that he loves to be invited into our homes. And last Sunday, we looked at Thomas, and it was really the third and fourth appearances as Jesus appears to the disciples and Thomas was not there. And then a week later, he arrives again to the disciples, and Thomas is there that time. That Jesus operates in our brokenness, in our pain, that we find strength in his wounds. That as Thomas stuck his hand in the side and his fingertips and the holes in his hands and his feet, he says, you are my God. And so this week, we're going to move for, further into the next occurrence. This post-crucifixion climate uh, must have seemed like Christ was gone and the people were starting to wonder, was their world really turned upside down? Was it really just that shattered? And for the disciples, he's already appeared to them twice. And the appearance we're going to look at in John 21 is the third appearance. And see, what happens is while he's present with them, they are all in. When he's in the room, they believe wholeheartedly. They're excited. They can't believe it. There's, there's joy. There's excitement. But as soon as he leaves, then the questions begin to come back in. The temperature of the room begins to change. I, I don't know if it is that Satan whispers in their ear. I don't know if they begin to replaying where they had failed in their life and guilt rises up, shame pushes to the top. I'm not sure what it may be, but they begin to really question Confusion may set in, but they begin to wonder what happened really happened. See, one of the things that we began to realize is that the whole ministry of Jesus is based out of the impossible. The whole thing, his whole life on earth is based out of the impossible. From a virgin birth all the way to the crucifixion and the resurrection, it doesn't make sense. 
It's just too hard to fathom. It, but our minds, we live in the possible. Jesus operates in the impossible. But we function in the possible. So when it comes time to try to figure things out, where faith is elevated, we tend to break down because we live in a realm of possible. When it doesn't make sense to us, we tend to start to fade away. And Peter and disciples are caught and wanting and trying to believe and questioning their whole life. They were wanting to be who they, were, they said they were, yet they are beginning to question what they've been doing. And they begin to question who they really are in this. So in John 21 today, we're going to look at this very first, we're going to go through this whole chapter today together, and we'll start in verse 1. And the uh, scripture will actually be up on the screens if you don't have your Bible or if you're not following along in the YouVersion Bible app. It said, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, some of the disciples were together here. I do love the fact that Thomas is there. He's accounted for. He has learned his lesson. He is not disappearing anymore, and he is there. It does, scripture does not tell us what they were talking about. We are unaware of the conversation happening in the room. And I think if we try to imagine it, or maybe we try to decide what was really taking place, that I think there was a lot going on. When I see that room, I see the disciples in there, and you, you know the kind that are nervous, they're pacing. Maybe there are people just talking, and we, you know the folks that when they get nervous, they just talk really fast. Maybe ramble. But I kind of see Peter crossed down in the corner, maybe sitting, and his knees pulled up, and maybe he's got a slight rock going. He's hesitant. And then just kind of out of nowhere, he just says, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go fish. I'm getting out of here. And I love the fact that he doesn't invite anybody to go with him. And the others say, hey, we're in too. I think Peter probably went, <sighs> you, know, you know, since it's Mother's Day, I know, because I've heard this at my house, mom's sometimes go to another part of the house to be alone. They need a break. And there is always, and you have had to install the type of security systems on the bathroom door that are legendary because children just come in and stand by you and want to ask you about Cheerios. I think this is where Peter's at. Peter just wants some time. He just needs to process a little bit about what's taken on and what's happening. Even through the denials and the failures, because they would have known exactly who he was. They would have known everything that has happened in the story. He's still the leader. Now, I'm not sure why they go fishing. I'm not sure why they did this. Maybe it was just a mental state. Maybe it was just complete shock. Maybe it was disbelief. Maybe it's the only thing that Peter truly understood in this point in his life. Maybe this is the only thing that just made sense. His world is completely shaken. What's happened, why it's happened, I don't think really makes any sense for him. Fishing may have been the only way he could get a grip on his life. So he went back to his former life. So by going fishing, he's saying, I am, I'm going to step back to who I was before I met Jesus. By going fishing, it was the thing that he grew up doing. It was, he, was, he was a fisherman's son. He understood the nets. He understood the sea. He understood the boat. He understood the fish. He understood the waves. He understood the weather patterns. Pete had a good grasp on what was going to take place, and that's where he had to go. But what we caught here in this verse is he couldn't go back. He, he couldn't go back to where he was. His former life no longer existed. He was actually stuck in the middle. He was unable to go back to what he used to do, and where he had been, he couldn't go forward because there was fear and confusion and lack of direction. See, I believe what happens in some real-life application for believers is we begin to think that your Christian journey and my Christian journey, our spiritual walk, is like a slide 
that once we get, we climb the ladder and we get to the top and we make this decision, we just go as fast as we can to the bottom. We just slide right through. And that's why we talk about it, that everybody enters in and you, you move on this, this spiritual journey that the hopeful become walkers or walkers become runners and our runners become sores. It's not that you get on that slide and you go straight down, that sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back. Because life is messy, it's complicated. It's hard. And it's really easy to get on that pendulum where we want to move forward and sometimes we go, I don't know. We begin to raise our hands and we get caught because our old life was very appealing. Our old life I get and where I've got to go I don't always understand. It doesn't always make sense because again, Jesus lives and operates in the realm of the impossible. See, when I was 13, we relocated from Pitcher, Oklahoma to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I, there were people that said, and all of our family, mom and dad have both had large families, all of our family, everybody lived in Oklahoma. And they would say, when we had to make that relocation, they said, the good news is, you will, you, when you move, you'll have friends in Alabama, and you will always be able to come home and have friends and family here. And that is true. They, they are very loving. We got a wonderful family. This is not a knock on them. But what I soon realized is that it was really hard because Tuscaloosa, even though that, that's where we relocated to, we weren't from there. So we never felt like we belong. I, I never felt like I belong because I wasn't from there. But then when we would go back to Oklahoma, I, it was almost like there was this 12-hour bus ride, and I got on them on the hour six. They had already, they had, there had been a whole lot of life in that year that I had missed that they were still living. So you get kind of stuck where you don't necessarily belong here, and you can't go back. And I, I think this is where exactly where Peter and the disciples are in this very moment on that boat when they have not caught anything. They understand there's a future, a preferred future in front of them, and there's a past they've had, and they are stuck in the middle. And where do we go? John uh, 21, verse 4 says this, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. Now, I believe that you can catch the tension which Jesus has a way of raising the intensity of the moment when we are in his presence. That he raises the intensity up because the guys in the boat are salty veterans and they had to feel like failures. They'd been fishing since childhood. We talked about that. But all of a sudden, they've got nothing. They have not caught anything. And they are being heckled by a man on the beach they don't know. Now, as it turns out, men get cranky when they get heckled especially by somebody they don't know. Now, I know that you have friends that it's okay, you can jab them, boys. You jab them because that's how you show your love. Women, you write notes, you give gift cards. We make fun of each other. It's the same thing, and that's how you weed out the weak. If they get mad, you don't want to spend time with them. So it's, just, it's really just human nature, and it's what happens. But Jesus really shows a sense of humor when he says, hey, did you catch anything? That's not a bad question. And then he says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now that's the heckle. I believe that Jesus, with his sense of humor, is giggling from the beach, waiting. Because I know that Peter probably said things under his breath, hoping Jesus didn't hear. Because it's probably ticked him off. They didn't recognize him. They'd spent three years with him. I mean, was it trauma? Was it stress? Were they focused on the wrong thing? I mean, how could it be possible? But he tells them to cast their nets to the other side. And then the catch was so large, they couldn't even pull it in. And John says, it's the Lord. And Peter, I love the fact that he instinctively gets redressed and jumps in the water. Now, maybe it was Peter had to say, I had to get to him. 
Maybe it was Peter's way of saying, I have failed him more, even since the three denials during the crucifixion time. Maybe it was beyond that. Maybe just in this last week, because I was in the room when he showed up, and now I have already doubted him again, and I'm fishing instead of looking after men. i I, I got to get to him. Or maybe it was just out of fear. Maybe it was just out of, he was just so bold. I mean, he was always the guy saying stuff. I mean, Pete, he flirted with being cocky. So maybe he just got to get there. Verse 8 says, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. See, we gotta allow the little things, the little things to speak into our life. The little things that happens in our life to really take place. That I love the fact that Jesus offers them the breakfast. He didn't need their fish. He already had some going. He already had some bread baking there on the coals. It talks about the 153. There's a lot of, there's a lot of story about what that means. And, and some of them make sense. Some of them say that maybe there was 153 people's groups that were, that were known in the world at that time. And it was representing one of all the people. And maybe it was how he says, you will be fisher, fishermen of men. And, and he talks about that. But I, I'm not sure why it's important, but it is important that it's in there. But I love that no one asks, who are you? They knew. They knew. They knew who it was. He had been identified by John, and everybody knew what was going to take place. But maybe the question that's not asked, that was really kind of being lived out that day on the beach, is, is it really you? They had some time to fill with him. They had some opportunity to be there and to, to really spend some time with him. But who knows what they were feeling? Who knows the emotions that were going to play? And I mean, really, when you go to fish, it's really about getting out there to find those answers. The craziest of their day needed some clarity. And they needed an opportunity to clear their minds, to see what was really going to happen. Verse 15. So what... So when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, this this conversation on the beach takes another twist. We talked about the intensity of the moment that Jesus is on the beach. He's yelling at them 100 yards off of shore, kind of heckling them. And then they come in, and now the disciples understand this is exactly who he is. This is the Lord. And that intensity moment kind of rises up, and he begins to break bread with them and sharing and talking. Now it goes to identifying the white elephant in the room. We have no, no part of this story in this section, in these three verses. Does he talk to the other disciples? It goes right to Peter. It focuses right on him. And I got to believe those other guys, they were froze with fear and anticipation. They know what Peter's done. They know he's the leader. They know he had denied Jesus. They know maybe some of the conversation that even happened in the upper room. They may even know why the real reason they went fishing that day. They know all these things taking place. And now all of a sudden, Jesus, one-on-one, is looking at Peter right in the eyes. And that would have been a little bit of a challenge. That would have been hard to watch. That would have been scary to see the intensity of what's taking place. And see, they knew about the three denials, and they knew that it was going to take these three affirmations. But one of the things that got him was, he doesn't call him Peter. He doesn't call him Rock. He calls him Simon, son of John. He calls him back to the name he had before Jesus 
knew him. He takes him back to the very beginning. He takes him back to when it first began. And he begins to ask him, almost in a way to say, you know, you're not who we were. It's, it's almost like he's rebooting the relationship. It's a fresh start with a little bit of a sting. And so when it says that it hurt him, that Peter said he was hurt by this, that there was some emotion there. Now, maybe it was the symbolism of the three times, just like when he had said to him, you know, I'll deny you three times. Maybe it was just like that. Maybe the three affirmations left a little bit of a sting because of that. But I think it was because he called him by his old name three times. Because Jesus was forcing Peter to confront his past. Jesus was forcing Peter to confront his past. See, there are some people that when they are wounded and hurt, we begin to believe that Jesus is haunting us with our past. That it's almost like he's being mean, almost a bully. Now, so let me, let me just kind of break for just a second. The moms, the, the neighborhood moms, the, the, the moms that have given birth, all, you, you have dealt with children. So you, you know what I'm going to say. Dads, you, we may have a different perspective on this. But you, moms, you know that when kids are riding their bikes, somehow there's always road rash involved. There is always that the kid that went off the handlebars, they, were, they, they built a ramp. And they were convinced they could jump the pickup truck. And kids are so pliable that they bounce. And they came up and they had the road rash in their hands and their knees and their calves. And they, they, they had this. Now, now, moms, if you have not experienced this yet, it's coming. It, and just so you know, I'm going to children's church in the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to let them in on the lie that you tell us. The lie that you tell us is, when we come in to get cleaned up with our tears on our cheeks, you go to that medicine cabinet and you break out this, I, I don't know what it's called, but death. What does it say death? And you tell us that it's not going to hurt. Now, it only takes once for you to realize that's a lie. But sometimes in a tra the trauma of our pain, we forget the second time, and we come. And for those of you old enough, you will remember the chemical that had the skull and crossbones on it, and they would pour it on your leg, and it would leave a red ring, a stain almost like a bright orange, and it basically, then they would take a match, and they, and it would just kerosene light, and it would kill all of the junk in the wound. And as you wept, your mother would then put the bandage over the wound, bring you in close, and tell you, maybe even kiss the band-aid, and tell you it's going to be better. Now, the worst and un most unloving thing you can do as a parent the most unloving thing you can do as a parent is when we come in with these road rashes, we come in with these marks, bumps, and bruises, and we come in in great pain, is to say, here, it's going to be okay. And we just put a Band-Aid over it. And we don't clean out the wound. If we did that, the worst thing that could ever happen is it's going to get infected. That junk that you slid across that asphalt with or the pavement or that concrete is nasty and if we don't take and put the chemicals in there to clean that up then that's going to get infected and it's going to fester and it's going to hurt and it's going to cause bigger issues than what you've experienced right now and see there there are some people that we would rather instead of deal with the problem deal with the wound we would rather put a band-aid over it kiss it and tell you it's going to be okay and that's the worst lie we can say because we've got to get into the wound, and it is going to hurt. But we've got to get into the wound for there to be healing. The most loving thing we can do is to put the right medicine on the right wound. It's the most loving thing we can do. And what happens here with Peter and Jesus, he's not being torturous to him. He's not being mean to him. He's not holding it over his head. This isn't about guilt relationship. What this is is he needed Peter to face the pain. 
He needed Peter to walk through the wounds and through the brokenness because until we are broken, it's really hard for Jesus to use us. Because see, Peter was too strong, he was too stubborn, he was too independent, and he didn't want to face his wound because too many people told him it was going to be okay. It was just going to be okay. But luckily for him, that Jesus met him right where he was and began to talk to him about we're going to walk through this wound together. Peter, Jesus needed Peter to be broken, to pass through his hurts and wounds to find the heart of the love of a Savior. And Jesus totally gets people. He totally understands who we are. He understands who you are. He understands who I am. And he meets us exactly where we are. See, in John 10, 11, he says this, a good shepherd is willing to die for his sheep. And he had to make sure Peter is who he says he is. He had to make sure as he's talking to him that he had to make sure that he understood. He had to make sure that Peter gets that if you're going to lead my people, there's going to come a time you're going to have to do what you don't want to do. And we can't go back to where we were. we got to move forward. And what I love here, that Jesus understood to reach the lost and the hurting, that you got to go where they are. I mean, Jesus didn't go back to the temple and wait for the guys. He didn't go back to the tomb that was barely used and wait there for him. In fact, he didn't go into the, maybe some of the houses he had eaten dinner in with some of his friends and wait there for him. He went to where the people were. He went to where his disciples were. He'd invested them. He went right there. And Christ, in turn, takes Peter back to where he was without reservation. He asked him these three questions. It was about a restoration of leadership, but it was also about identifying, are you going to be who you say you're going to be? See, that there's all kinds of miraculous things that happen here. There's the catch, the fish, the fire, the food, the boat. All of those things are really cool. They didn't have choices. Peter had a choice to make. At that moment in time on the beach, he could have said, I'm walking away. The future is too hard. The relationship is too complicated. And I'm going to go back to where I used to be. Verse 18 says, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved with him, who loved following them. And this was what uh, he leaned back to him at the supper table and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that the disciples would not die. But Jesus did not say that, that they would not die. He only said, if I want them to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that this testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not even the whole world would not have a room of the books to be written. See, this mood of the conversation really changes on the beach. It changes more from where are we at and our relationship to the future. It begins to point to what's going to happen to Peter. And he says, basically, regardless of what takes place, you must follow me. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how, com how uh, complicated it gets, you must follow me. That the very first things that Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 4, 18 is to follow me. And the very last thing he says to him that's recorded is follow me. See, we know that Jesus works with the broken better than anybody or anything else in the world. He has this way of taking our hurts and our wounds and the things that are impacting our life and walking with us. And walking with us. See, too many too many who see our wounds and our hurts and we avoid them. We ignore them. We pretend they're not there. We choose to believe that they're just going to get better. But Jesus says, I will walk through this with you. Now see, I, I know that I'm blessed. I, I have a, a wonderful mom. And when she would gather me up and I had the road rash and the scrapes and the bruises and the bangs, that there was the medicine that had to go on because that would have been cruel not to do that. That had been cruel. But there's also that moment where the medicine would get ready to be applied and the bandage would go on. There was always that moment as a young child that there would be the pool in. 
that in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the, the hurt, in the midst of the wound, it was this moment to say that I got you. I got you. And so for us to be in focus and to really get who Jesus is, that we have to meet him at our wounds, at our pain, at our disappointment. And we got to say, I need you, and allow him to bring us in. I'm just going to tell you, the longer you avoid, the longer you pretend, the harder it will get. The harder it will get. Because there's real power in this. Because there is this reckless love. There is this fierce love that Jesus has that just says, I choose you, I love you, and I want you. And he takes us. But until we're broken, until we admit it, until we come clean, it is really hard. It is really hard to go forward. It's really hard to take the next step Whatever that may be, from hopeful to walker, walker to runner, runner to sore, whatever you're at, wherever if you put your finger, hard for you to take the next step in your spiritual life, in your spiritual journey, until you come clean, until I come clean. It's hard to move forward. 